Welcome to the Archives of Legend and Lore. I am the Chaotic GM and every week I will bring a monster, humanoid, aberration, or some other being to the gaming table and put it in the spotlight so to say. We'll discuss some of the lore, the differences in editions, and possible ways to use them in your one shot or campaign. This time, we'll be uncaging and looking at a reptile friend of mine, the Cobalt. Be careful, these little boogers have sharp teeth. I hope you didn't miss me too much. I did miss a week there, due to illness. As you can tell, hopefully, it sounds like my voice is a lot better. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into story time. This week, I submit for your approval, coming home. Dimitri was a fighter in the Third War, a war that his army lost. He had been in prison for over 20 years, or so the person that freed him said. He had never thought that he would ever smell fresh air again or see the sun. He was severely malnourished, and most of his once muscular frame had wasted away, bones showing through the cloth he wore his clothes. The war had been wrong, two lords fighting each other, forcing their citizens to battle. He had no idea what befell his old kingdom. Did any of his family still live? Did his keep still stand? It would take months to walk home, and that was if he was lucky. He'd have to take what jobs he could find along the way, working for food, clothing, or maybe just a night's lodging, never revealing who he truly was. Most people treated him kindly. There were good people still in this region. He slowly regained some of his weight and muscle. Firewood always needed cut, water always needed carried. A fire broke out in a blacksmith in a small town along the way. He stayed there for four days helping to rebuild and was gifted with a real sword and some discarded armor. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than just using your fists. As he finished the tavern's dishes and helped carry some barrels into the cellar, he could feel the anticipation growing. Tomorrow he would cross over into the lands he once called home. He would still be several days travel from his keep, but he would be home. His vision blurred with a few tears. He lay his head down to drift off to sleep. Dimitri walked down the road and came up to the river that separated the lands, one of his people and one of his captors. He closed his eyes, but no sound of water came, no birds singing, just wind and silence. That is when he noticed the road was in ill repair. The bridge looked like it would fall apart if he rode a horse across it. He walked up to the river. The water was gone. A long, dried bed of cracked mud and rock was his greeting. Looking to the other side, the trees were burnt and dead. Once an apple orchard thrived there. Grass had been replaced with weeds and thorns. Dread filled him. He felt like he was back in his prison again, hope quickly draining from him. For the next several days, Dimitri walked, keeping just off the road so he could be hidden. The buildings were in ruins, burned or collapsed. Farms gone, no people anywhere to be seen. His heart grew heavy, and despair started to sink in. He almost turned around, not wanting to know what befell his kin and his lands. His brothers, only children when he left, his parents, they were his age now when he went to war. That night, he stayed in an old tavern that was at a crossroad. It was rubble now, and had been like that for years. Still no signs of life. He went to sleep and almost hoped to wake up back in the prison. Partway through the night, he was awakened by a noise of an argument in a language he didn't know. It was guttural and had a lot of hissing in it, savage sounding. Dimitri stayed still and only to listen. He could make out two voices, if that's what you'd call them. Then he heard a smack and someone cry out, Tell us what you'd have us do. It was a female voice, full of fear. His old training took over and he jumped into movement. He was not as quick and agile as he used to be, but he could still move pretty well. Dimitri burst from the ruins and quickly drank in the scene. Four humans were chained to each other. They looked almost as bad as he did from prison. Next to them were two, three feet tall reptilian forms, one holding the chains and one facing away. Kobolds. With a quick jab with his sword, he impaled the one with his back to him through the heart. As Dimitri withdrew his sword from the crumpling body, the other kobold just stood there in disbelief. He quickly cleaved the head off before the second one could even regain its wits. For long seconds, no one said a word. Dimitri hadn't killed anything in almost two decades. The humans cowered and covered their faces. A quick search proved fruitful, and he found the keys to their shackles. The woman bowed her head to him. What will you do with us? You were free. I only asked for information, Dimitri replied. What happened to everyone here? What happened to the people from the village of Porlos? All the towns fell at the end of the war, burnt or worse. Our king abandoned us. We have lived as slaves in one form or another ever since. The new masters, the kobolds, make us mine the ore from the earth. Not many of us remain. Porlos is where their encampment is. It had the best mines. 
She looked longingly towards where he came from. Dimitri puts a gold in her hand. Go across the river, follow the road to the first small village, and go to the tavern. Give that to the innkeep and tell him Dimitri sent you. He will feed you and clothe you. She picks her head up and looks him in the eyes. Thank you, kind sir, before grabbing the others and running off. Dimitri hides the bodies and recovers a crossbow, bolts, and a dagger from the bodies. With a renewed vigor, he heads towards home, not even wanting to wait until day comes. The kobolds he killed were the last living things he came across until reaching the edge of Porlos. Using the crossbow, he dispatched a few lookouts he found. After hiding the bodies, he could see fires burning in the village. The sun was almost completely set, and if he went a wide loop around town, he could be at his keep in about an hour. Without any more instant, his home came into view. The walls were rubble. The buildings inside were burnt and rotted. Moss covered most of the surfaces. No lights were visible, and the place was abandoned. He sat by the walls and mulled over what he would do. There was no home anymore, no family, no village, just kobolds and pain. They were enslaving the last of his people. Ha! His people? None of them probably even know him. If he was meant to die, though, he would do it with honor. He was freed for a reason. Maybe, just maybe, he might free a few more of these people. He came to a decision. He was going to take out as many as he could. It had to be now. They would miss the century soon and alarm would be raised. He would circle the encampment and take out all the sentries with the crossbow, and then turn in to the town, trying to take out as many as he could. Moving silently, Dimitri circled the town, killing with deadly accuracy. Looking into town, he could see a building with guards posted outside, probably where the prisoners were kept. He might be able to get close enough to take several of them out before the alarm was sounded. Around a fire, about eight of the beasts were sleeping. A cellar door by the old tavern had two guards by it. Looks like an officer's quarters to him. So that's 12 that he can see. Once he loses surprise, he loses the upper hand. Dimitri creeps in as close as he can, decision made. He aims the crossbow at one of the sleeping kobolds with a thwump that sounded like thunder to him as his bolt was released, striking true when the sleeping kobolds breathed no more, a bolt sticking out of his head. He waited, checking that nothing was heard before reloading a bolt. Letting another one fly, he cut down one more of the sleeping lizards. Realizing that they have gotten complacent and lost any fear of being attacked, Dimitri dispatches the rest of the sleepers. The guards will be more difficult. They are close together and will notice if the other one drops. Dimitri sneaks behind the building, housing the prisoners. The village was his. It may be in ruins, but it is still the same layout. Crossbow ready, he comes beside the one guard on the corner and runs at him, releasing the bolt at the other. The bolt flies past the head of the first guard that looks to where it came from as a sword pierces its throat. Pulling the sword out, Dimitri jabs it in the head again, making sure it's dead. Remembering the other guard, he quickly looks up. It lays on the ground, a bolt through its eye. He quickly hides the bodies and opens the door. No more guards, only a big room with straw on the floor and people sleeping. A few stir at the opening of the door. He makes a shush sign at them. Any more guards in here? He whispers. The prisoner shakes his head no. There are no sentries. Run past the general store, turn by the stables and head out of town. You'll be safe. I'll cut as many more down that I can, one when you see me charge the other guards. The prisoner nods and starts waking up the others. Dimitri heads out the door. Trying the same tactics as before, he comes up the side alley beside the guards and readies his crossbow. He runs out, letting the bolt fly and jabs the other kobold. The kobold hurt him though and dodged just enough so that the blow was not a lethal one. Dimitri slams the guard in the face and hears bone crush and then red hot pain hits him in his back. He whips around, dagger still stuck in him, and faces the other kobold. His own sword wrenches free of his hand as the first guard crumples, dead. The guard rushes him. It lunges at him, biting him in the leg. Dimitri lets him in and pulls the dagger free from his back. He plunges the dagger down into the thing's neck at the base of the skull, and it goes limp. Dimitri stands there for a second, blood running down his back, a chunk of his leg missing. About 20 humans are staying outside the building where they were kept. They were just staring at him. What were they doing? Run, he yells. The door behind him explodes open and a kobold emerges. He sees this lone human and bares its teeth. In a flash, it jumps on him. Weaponless, he tries landing blows, but the thing is so quick and the biting is ferocious. Then the pain fades. His vision is red with blood. He thinks to himself, so this is my grand ending, bitten to death by a lizard. A face comes into view, a familiar face. The face looks like his did all those years ago. He must be dreaming. Dimitri, is that really you? The man starts crying. After all these years, my brother, you have come home, 
and freed us from our slavers. Dimitri feels the warmth of his brother's hug and feels love again. It is good to be home. I hope you enjoyed the story. Second edition Monstrous Mano describes them as cowardly, sadistic race of short humanoids that compete with human and demi-human races for living space and food. They especially dislike gnomes and attack them on sight. Barely clearing three feet in height, kobolds have scaly hides that range from dark rusty brown to a rusty black. They have eyes that glow a bright red and have two small horns ranging from tan to white. They have their own language that sounds like small dogs yapping, but can learn other languages. They live in dark, damp places underground and in overgrown forests and can be found in almost any climate. Kobolds will not always kill their victims, but will sell them as slaves, or worse, eat them. Kobolds are distrustful of strangers and hate brownies, pixies, sprites, and gnomes. Oh, thank goodness. At first I was like, man, they don't like brownies? I mean, what do they got against them? Do they like cake? Whatever. Um, gnomes are never eaten or taken prisoner. Kobolds can live up to 135 years of age. In 5th edition, kobolds are craven, reptilian humanoids that worship evil dragons and serve them. Sometimes they inhabit dragon lairs, but more commonly infest dungeons, gathering treasures and trinkets to add to their own hordes. They are egg-laying creatures that mature quickly and can live to be great worms. I did that with air quotes. Great worms. More than a century old. Kobolds hate gnomes and pranks of any kind in this edition. A few kobolds are born with leathery wings and can fly, known as erds. It is erds. I didn't just forget the T, right? It's not like turds, because that'd be funny. It, you know, flying turds. Oh, sorry. They like to lurk on high ledges and drop rocks on passerbys. Although the erds' wings are seen as gifts from Tiamat, the Dragon Queen, wingless kobolds are envious of these gifts and don't get along with the erds. Yeah, I never met a turd I liked. Da da. Pathfinder describes kobolds as small, reptilian humanoids who carry physical similarities to true dragons. They share more than a superficial resemblance to true dragons, with scale coloration closely matching the colors seen among chromatic dragons. They lurk in dark spaces, usually tunnels and mines beneath the earth, and colonies of their own making or complexes discovered and colonized after the original builders have moved on. Kobolds are diligent and hardworking creatures, though they often turn these virtues towards selfish ends. This week's sponsor is Valen's Folly, an old show brought to you by the Problem Solvers via the Chaotic GM's channel. That's right, my channel. This Real Play 2nd Edition D&D podcast was recorded in 2013 and is now being re-released here. If you enjoy chaos, and I know you do, give it a listen. This dysfunctional group of players solves riddles, puzzles, and quests in the most abnormal ways, mainly with fire. It is sure to bring a tear to your eye. I am told to warn listeners, there is strong language and adult themes throughout, so give it a try. The Problem Solvers, Valen's Folly, available on the Chaotic GM's podcast and YouTube channel. That's right, a real sponsor this time. I paid myself good money for this one. <laughs> now, on to the combat. In 2nd edition, the Kobold approach to combat uses overwhelming odds or trickery. Kobolds will attack gnomes on sight, but will think twice about attacking humans, elves, or dwarves, unless the kobolds outnumber them at least two to one. They often hurl javelins and spears, preferring not to close in until they see that their enemies have been weakened. Kobolds are wary of spellcasters and will aim for them whenever possible. They also enjoy setting up concealed pits with spikes, crossbows, and other mechanical traps. They usually have viewports and murder holes. Yes, murder holes. Near these traps so that they can pour flaming oil, missile weapons, or drop poisonous insects on their victims. Wow, that's like so many ideas right there. That, that's pretty awesome. They are usually armed with spike clubs, axes, javelins, short swords, and spears. Kobolds have a 60-foot infravision, but do not see well in bright sunlight, suffering a negative one on their attack rolls. 5th edition has them have sunlight sensitivity. While in sunlight, the kobold has disadvantage on attack rolls, as well as on perception checks that rely on sight. They fight with pack tactics and have an advantage on attack roll against a creature if at least one other kobold ally is within 5 feet of the creature and the ally isn't incapacitated. They use weapons but prefer traps to end their enemies. Pathfinder has three main classes, the warrior, scout, and dragon mage. The typical warrior trains with agile weaponry, favoring the light pick for its use in crafting new tunnels to expand their domains throughout underground reaches. Warriors use spears and slings to down a foe from a distance, if possible. Most kobolds encountered outside of a well-defended lair are kobold scouts. 
Creatures train for stalking and the hunt. Cobalt dragon mages use magic to bring demise to all that oppose them. The presence of a dragon mage in a cobalt warren is one of the greatest testaments to the cobalt's claim to, dr to draconic heritage. Now, on to my favorite part of the show. Let's flick our tongues over some fresh ideas in the Chaos Creative Corner. Scenario 1. An elven priest has contacted you. He had a temple deep within the forest that he hasn't had contact with for over a hundred years. They were a secluded bunch, but he has been worried and would like the adventurers to go and check on them. After being given a map, they head out in the forest and locate the temple. It was carved out of a mountainside, and the front of it doesn't look too promising. Vines have covered most of it, and the stone is moss-covered and dirty. A small opening can be made out, though, but two kobolds stand guard at it. They will be hostile and attack, or flee inwards for more support. So the kobolds have set up a camp in the temple, but when questioned, they found the place abandoned quite some time ago. Deep down, they found a door, and strange sounds come from it, and they believe it to be haunted. None dare go there. What's behind the door? Well, I'll leave that up to you. Perhaps a demon killed the elves when they ventured too far into their mountain. Or the elves turned evil and have been corrupted into demonic forms. <sighs> or if you like happy endings, the door was locked and no one had a key to the warehouse where they kept the food and supplies, and the elves have been trapped down there this whole time. I'd lean towards snobby demonic elves, but it's up to you. Scenario 2. This one's pretty easy. You all know kobolds make great minions, right? Have you ever seen the movie Minions? Are you following me here? A group of kobolds have attached themselves to a party member to be their minion. Chaos and hilarity ensue. What? I thought it was funny. Scenario 3. The party wakes up on a cold stone floor after a night at the local inn. Eh, that's really not that unusual. But what is, is the kobolds looking down on them from a ledge just out of reach. They shout down, letting the party know that they are part of a dungeon test to make better traps and puzzles. They need to move on through the door and into the next room if they ever want to leave. So that's the whole thing, really, in a nutshell. The party must move on from room to room, solving puzzle and escaping traps. All while, the kobolds watch on and get frustrated when they don't die. This one could be pretty chaotic and pretty fun. Well, while we chatted, the kobolds have eaten most of my arm, so I better take care of them. I always like having visitors in my little slice of chaos. If you enjoyed yourself, please consider giving me a review on your podcast platform of choice, or like and subscribe on YouTube, where a video format can be found. It is, however, several weeks behind on publishing. I hope you can join me next time when we blow the dust off the tomes and look deep within their pages. Remember, if you truly are chaotic, your players will never know what you'll do next.